The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Well, Happy New Year, and welcome to this first show of 2016 on NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today is Eugene Braxton, who has been researching the meaning of his many out-of-body episodes and a near-death experience from drowning. Eugene Braxton, who describes himself as an American mystic and near-death alien abduction researcher, is also a writer and filmmaker who lives in Philadelphia. He's the author of America's Mystic Solves Near-Death Riddle. Eugene, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. I uh, hope things are well in Philadelphia, my old stomping it's, ground. It's cold here, but it's uh, it's dry. Everything's uh, kind of like a normal winter day instead of the hot weather we've been having lately. Oh, uh, well, that's the, I guess it's the appropriate to the time of year. Eugene, if you could, um, uh, please begin by describing the details of your near-death experience. Okay. Well, the uh, research actually started with Grayson, but the experience happened when I was 15. I was uh, swimming with a church youth group in a lake, and I jumped in seat first instead of head first. Uh, I jumped, jumped in seat first, mm-hmm. and I got stuck in the muck uh, underneath the lake. I got stuck up to, to the knee, Lee. Oh, my gosh. Could not could not get out. Uh, I struggled and thrashed until finally I sucked in a huge gulp of water, lake water, and filled mm-hmm. up, like they show in the movies, it filled up with air. And um, that's where the paralyzation started in. And uh, I became paralyzed. I fell down on the bottom of the lake um, and was uh, rigidly paralyzed. I could see, I could think, and um, I could feel and hear, but I couldn't move. So uh, I stayed like that for a while until uh, and I was able to watch myself completely die, like second by second. And I was also looking to see if any friends would come down and uh, pull me up out. You know, notice I was missing, pull me up out of the lake, but uh, none sure. ever did. Uh, so that was the beginning of uh, what would be like a, a, a kind of long... Uh, and long remembered uh, near death. Um, I was able to remember uh, almost about 98% of mine. And uh, we've seen that there's always some kind of uh, lapses in consciousness in the near, near death, uh, things that the person doesn't remember, doesn't see. Um, in fact, only one in four people remember, you know, anything. Uh, the majority don't, but a lot do. And um, how how far did you go with it? Did you feel yourself going uh, down a tunnel or into the light? Any of those uh, phenomena? Yeah, I was able to go all the way until I came back to life. I went through every stage of the near death and uh, kind of have them uh, categorized and lined up. But um, I was able to remember every stage. Yes, Lee, I had had. Uh, like thousands of out of bodies as a kid, and that's mm. kind of like uh, the near death is an out of body too, like a spiritual out of body. So it gave me a good sure. head start. Um, I was used to out of bodies, and um, um, I was also uh, very good at dreaming. So I had a lot of memory retention, and uh, I think memory is the, the main, the mis- the main key to solving the near death is the people can remember more, mm. and. Uh, We have uh, seven memory issues that uh, prevent people from remembering the near death. Uh, Further, I can talk about them later. But did uh, you did you were you met on the other side? Did you see any uh, family members or angels? uh... (laughs) That's the the good question. That's exactly what the uh, great Doctor Grayson P. M. H. Atwater asked. Um, The at the time, there was a judgment, 
and uh, also I've lined up all the stages, which I can read off later too. But at the judgment, this was after death. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I there was, um, you know, you have the life review. There was during the judgment when God came to me to judge me. There was a being communicating to God about me on my behalf. And the scientists wanted to know if that was God, an angel, Jesus, or 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 whoever, but uh speaking in my behalf to God uh, after the life review, there was a being that I couldn't I could feel his presence or its presence, but I couldn't really see it. Uh, but it was definitely mediating in my behalf for me to get into heaven. And uh, the being was successful. <laughs> <laughs> but, so yes, to that question. Um, yes, well, yeah, let's, uh, let's, look, let's look at the life for you for a minute. Was that, uh, uh, would you describe it as uh, de- depressing or traumatic? Or uh, how, how did you take that? My life review, uh, it began in a room, and I drew some pictures in the book, it began in a room that was built like a, a huge tire. It was like a circular room. And in it, there were uh, three flat screens. One showed everything I did, the other one showed everything I thought, and the other one showed everything I said. And it was, uh, in this room, I floated my, uh, in midair, and watched uh, all those things happen like simultaneously. There was action going on in all three screens, and I was able to remember and refeel uh, the event as it happened in my mind. Um, everything I did in one scene, I could feel the repercussions from it, uh, not only in the screen, but also right then. Like, for example, I threw a stone when I was a kid at a, a kid in camp. They, I was re-shown that, and I felt the rock hitting me that I had thrown at him. So, uh, and it was, uh, there was no judgment with the life review. Uh, they were re-showing my life so that a few minutes later, in the judgment, there could be no doubt as to what I had had in life, had done in life, had thought, had said. And because my life had just been replayed uh, to me. And so when uh, the direct time for the judgment uh, came, there was no uh, way I could say I didn't do anything because God already knew what I had done and I had just been shown it. But there was labor. Also, um, it was kind of used as a teaching uh, tool to ask me what things I could have done better, what things, um, you know, they were... They were in judgment, they just showed it to me and explained maybe how things could have been better. But that was just like a review, not really. The judgment would come after the review, yes. Yeah. And then how did how did God appear to you? Did he appear as a person or as a light? Um, in, initially, when I saw God, I was standing on a beach, just like that, that scene in the movie Contact, and I heard other near deathers say, uh, talk about beach-type setting. So, once I regained consciousness after death, I found myself, uh, and I was aware that I was awake and alive, I found myself in the life review room, and then uh, after the life review room, the scene just uh, changed, and that, that shows a potential lapse of consciousness when the scene just changes into something else. Also, when the per- Person, when the person has a change in the level of consciousness, or they realize that they wake up to a higher uh, level of reality, their spirit body changes, too, and we have those changes in the spirit body. But uh, uh, answering your question about seeing God, uh, yeah, I found myself, after the life review, standing on this beach, and God came to me. It looked like what It looked like the sun was rising. And I looked into the horizon and saw what looked like the sun coming up. And the sun was rising. So as this sun sphere rose, it began to slowly change color. It went from like an orange, a bright orange, to uh, a darker and darker red. And um, 
as the uh, sun sphere that I saw as God moved across the sky to me, I began to rise in the air in unison with it. And that was uh, oh, wild and interesting, but uh, thrilling at the same time. So I saw this thing coming towards me across the horizon. I didn't see it move. I saw it, it, it was at once at 12 o'clock, then 2 o'clock, then 4, uh, and it was just suddenly in front of me. So it's not in front of me, but about 50 yards away. So it moved, but I didn't see it move uniformly throughout the sky. It was here, and here, and then here. But uh, I saw it as God, and it came to me since a person would uh, probably take them many light years to go to God if they ever could. Mm. So God came to me. I rose in the sky as he came, and and suddenly, uh, within a, what seemed to be a few seconds, I was floating in the air with God right in front of me. Wow. And that was the beginning of the judgment. Now, was was this a scary process? Were you frightened of, about being judged? There was. It was, and that's exactly another perfect question because I had a, a mixture of fear and ecstatic happiness. I was afraid because it was God coming for the big judgment, whether I would continue to live, whether I'd get into heaven, and He was definitely coming. It was there, so I was. There was some primal fear. I was shaking with fear. And at the same time, I was literally uh, floating or beaming, twinkling with, with happiness, because I knew that if anyone could get me out of this jam, it would be God. And, <laughs> you know, he's the perfect one you want to call if there's a life or death a judgment thing. And so I was super happy that it was God, and also uh, trembling in fear, because he's the one who could say no. But he didn't. And uh, so it was a yeah, mixture of primal fear and primal ecstasy. And we found uh, more of that in the near-death experience, too. Mm. Were you able to go on past that in in the NDE, or at what point did they tell you you had to go back? Uh, yes, that was... Uh, and I'll remember to read this near-death stages that uh, we found that uh, occur in order. But, uh, yes, I was. that was about the midpoint of the near-death. And there was more to come. Um, after God's judgment, and he asked, he asked me three things. What I had done to help myself, to improve myself, what I had done for others, was number two. And um, if I had always believed that he was God, or if I had always believed in him. And the answer was yes, and as soon as I said yes, I was automatically in. That was his prime question, if the person believed in him. And once they do, they're in. And the other things can be worked out. But um, that was about it, it, the mid... Yes, go ahead. I was going to say it would be hard not to believe in him when you're standing right in front of him like <laughs> that. Yes. But uh, you know what? I think and uh, I think that if the pers- once the person dies and crosses over, I don't think there's time for like a, a deathbed, you know, uh, switch over. I think you have to believe in him before you expire uh, for him. I think he would forgive anyone, but I think you have to believe in him before that judgment, you know. So if we believe in him on earth, then I don't know what he would do if the person suddenly believed upon sight. That would seem, to me, it seem too late, but I think he would be nice enough to still let them in. It's a uh, it's that, his kind of forgivingness, and uh, just a depth. It's like uh, something you can't see. It's just like that, like the air. But I think he would definitely forgive a person who sincerely... Well, like you said, you'd have to believe in them then, but that's, uh, I think but, they have, should believe first. To get yeah, you'd have to be honest with them, too. Yeah. Uh, now, many Christians believe that uh, you have to believe that Jesus is God or the Son of God in order uh, to get into heaven. But th- you're talking about God, not uh, just God, aren't you? In other words, is this this is a, a passage that's available to somebody who's not a Christian? I think, yes. I think with, with God and my near death, he is open to uh, Jesus. 
I saw Jesus as the mediator or the inter you know the uh the mediator between me and God and uh God and I and mm-hmm. um I think that uh, God is God and Jesus is Jesus and um but I think anyone can get to God I think you can go directly to him like say if someone didn't believe in God Jesus uh, uh, they could still get to God. Uh, I yes. see a separation between God and Jesus. I know Jesus is Jesus, but God is God. And I think he wants that. Um, I think he wants that single attention. Um, just like they used to say, that like he is a jealous God. And it's not that he's a jealous God, but I think he wants to be known that he is he, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't think if people, I don't think if someone didn't believe in God, Jesus, they would still have a chance with God. He's just that big, and that I couldn't see that as no problem. But Jesus was in the mix too, yes. and he is a completely different, deep. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> did you get any? Developed. Did you get any indication of what heaven might be like? I did. And uh, also, we got an indication of what might happen further, further down to our individual personalities and consciousness down the road. But yes, I did uh, get an indication of heaven. And in that uh, realm or dimension, or the spirit body uh, alterates even more, and it goes to a finer, higher, like sparkling essence, where the body, where the person becomes just a, a pinpoint of consciousness. In the lower uh, uh, secondary uh, part of uh, before the, uh, like they call heaven, the third heaven, but before that highest realm, the person is in a an invisibly solid, invisible body. It's the exact duplicate of our body here uh, mm. on Earth. And the person is in prime health, too. You know, if someone died at 76, they would be slightly younger. They would be at the the peak of their health uh, in spirit body form. No pain, no neck aches, no headaches, no toothache, no, none of that is gone. Everything's gone. But uh, there was a, an, in, in the heavenly uh, uh, level, there was a, a finer, you were just like consciousness itself, and the spirit body had uh, dissipated, uh, and it vibrated so fast that it was not visible, but you could still know that you were there. If you know what I mean, and you were there with with other people, people that you knew. I they uh, I heard during the eighties before I got involved, and I had heard other people talking about they met their grandparents and stuff like that. I mm-hmm. didn't see, and I was only fifteen when it happened, so I didn't know a lot of people had died, if anyone. But I didn't see any kind of relatives, pets, cousins, or uh, uh, now I had you know I was only I didn't know. I was only a teenager, but I didn't see any people. I saw, I saw with other beings. Uh, uh, there's a part at the end of the near death where the person, especially in the near death, where the person has to be kind of reanimated back to life and and, and re-resurrected back to life. During that part, I did see uh, other beings. Um, it was also in that reanimation process that uh, the person merges and mixes and melds with God. And they meld uh, physically and they merge mentally. And so it's like a, a, it's, it's a, it's a, that's where the person feels that they see God, they mix in with it. And they do, they mix right in with his essence because that's where they came from originally. So it would be possible to mix back into where you came from. But wow. there's a, a physical and a mental merging with God. Uh, you cannot a person cannot know the mind of God, that, but they can merge back into that which they are from, and that's that's what does happen. A lot of times, the person doesn't remember it, but they do merge because that's part of the reanimation process to bring them back to life. Right. It's, when you merge, when you merge with God, do you lose your own personality, or do you retain that? No, you don't. You retain your own individual personality and consciousness. You're still you but you can feel mm. and experience his presence in you at the same time. Wow, what a powerful emotion that must be. 
that is. You're still, and that's the height of that, that primal ecstasy I was talking about. And the person is just, you're literally orgasmic. And I think P.A. Dr. Atwater said that you're literally, in other experience, you're literally orgasmic with pleasure. Mm. To the point where we actually became concerned about that amount of pleasure. Um, mm. I did, and uh, so did uh, Dr. Grayson. But there was, uh, uh, that's the primal ecstasy that people feel, that, that happiness that comes. But uh, in those things, if there's too much emotion or too much fear or too much ecstasy, that's something to to notice but not to react to. And I and I watch everything stoically, uh, without emotion. And that was an interesting facet that we checked into more because there's more that goes in into the near death than what's currently known. It, there's a sub reality underneath the near death. It's first necessary to remember and understand the exact near death, what happens or what seems to happen, because a lot of the, the near death experience is interwoven with uh, reality and illusion, spiritual illusions. But um, hmm. that's why the calmness. Now, yes. How now? At what point did they tell you you had to rejoin your body, and how did you get um, saved from under the lake? Yeah, the lake uh, saving. And I have heard other stories, and uh, I was stuck up to the knee, and uh, suddenly, you know how when you uh, are fishing and you have a fish on the side of the boat, inside the boat, and he's flopping around on the dry dock or dry boat? I was mm-hmm. like that, and once you pick up that fish and throw him back in water, he kind of wakes back up and swims around. That's what happened to me. I was stuck underneath there, and some kind of... Uh, uh, either force yanked me out or pushed me up out of the muck. Suddenly I was free. I'm like the fish in the bucket. I just woke back up and swam up to the dock. I threw up. Oh, it sounds, it sounds almost like you had supernatural help to get out of there. Definitely. Definitely. It was either something pulling me up out of there or pushing me out, but it came from a power outside my own. Wow. Now you, uh, you have had mystical experiences. Did they um, come as a result of this near-death experience, or did, had you had them before? I had them before, Lee, uh, since about age six, and the near-death was like a graduation of all those experiences. Mm. That's what and what I sort of mystical say. experiences? Were they like prophecy, or could you see a, a re- remote viewing? What, what was it like? I had done remote viewing a few times. In fact, uh, the 76 years player had lost the son and I remote viewed him accurately but prophecy future dreams that came to pass a clear audience where you can hear things spiritually um, dreams dream control out of bodies out of body control um, so remote viewing uh, haunted houses it's uh, once you have one psychic or, or esoteric experience it's it it brings more on and to, and then more and to the point where the person becomes a current prone and they literally can't stop the experiences. But a lot of times by that time they're used to them. Uh, mm. So one begets another and then another and uh, started with has, dreams. Has has it been a problem for you uh, living like that? When I was a teenager, yes, because uh, even though I had asked for them at age nine. Uh, throughout high school, the last thing I wanted was to be rising out of the bed or falling through the sky during a dream or uh, drowning in the lake. And I had had future dreams, repeating dreams of drowning in the lake that I ignored because I was a swimmer. So I thought, you know, I, how can I drown? I'm a swimmer. And But I did, and those dreams came to pass. So, yeah, all the deja vu, all of that stuff I had uh, before uh, 15. Then at 15, I had the near death, and then UFO experiences after the near death. So it, they all seem to be connected, Lee. All these experiences, like a family, like the rooms of a mansion that they talk about in the Bible, they all seem to definitely be connected with one another. Do you, do you have any idea why you were chosen to have these gifts, and what you're supposed to do with them? Well, 
I, when I was nine, I asked God to show me all these things in that invisible realm. And I told him if he did, I would always tell people about it. And then two years later, around 11, he started in earnest. I really started to have it. Um, and they would last hard until from age 6 to 16. Then I would have them throughout the 20s and 30s, too. But uh, I asked for them. I wanted them. I knew that there was another reality behind ours. I wanted to see it. And I asked, he let me see. That's how I see it. I think, uh, you know, I think that goes beyond genetics. Uh, I, you know, I don't think, I think it was me asking him. Because uh, the belief helps. That helps yes. so much, especially in that. That other now you've you've called in your in your the book's title is uh, 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 refers to a near death riddle and that you've solved it. Um, what do you what do you mean by a near death riddle and what's the solution? The the riddle of the near death is that there's a few like um, what exactly happened because uh, there's so people remember but. Uh, what is it that they remember, a blur of a fragment of a memory or a spiritual illusion that they thought they saw but really didn't? So uh, the memory was the first thing to understanding exactly what happened. It was like a riddle. No one knew what order, what stages, what, what happened. You know, mm-hmm. you had a life review. And then you, so uh, the, and the, the near-death is an experience that has a certain order, a certain structure, a certain pattern. And it has repeating patterns that can be uh, observed if the person remembers this. And there's a, a continuity of consciousness where the person can have a single, uninterrupted stream of memory. That's what's needed to... Because uh, uh, solving what happened in the near death was basically a memory problem. And um, there's so, several memory issues that I can, I'll read off too, but like the lapses of consciousness. Uh, where a person just goes from one scene to another without remembering how they got there. That's, uh, that was, uh, concerning. Why, why, and some people are told that they will not remember certain things, but we find that yes. people remember more from the near death than from UFOs. But the memory thing, that's the issue with the near death, why it couldn't be figured out because most people couldn't remember it. Um, but then you had a secondary question, I think, Lee. Well, you know, we're, we are getting short on time, and I want you to tell people um, how they might get in touch with you through a website or um, how they can get a copy of your book, for sure. Okay. Uh, the best way to get a copy of the book is to order it right on my website, um, mainly because Amazon takes 90% of the, ah. the, uh, from the author and publisher. That's a lot, 90 It, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> and my... <clears throat> So how how can they order it directly from you? Um, my website is Braxton uh, Eugene. This is one word: Braxton Eugene at uh-huh. wait Braxton Eugene dot wix w i x dot com slash America's Mystic. And then very good. Uh, yeah, Braxton Eugene dot wix dot america oh wait dot wix slash america's mystic and the website is also online too very good wow well this is it's an amazing story eugene and i'm i am so grateful to you for having shared it with us um you're welcome we're just just (laughs) beginning to get into it yes i know and i hope everyone goes out and buys a copy of your book and perhaps we can uh talk again i Uh, We didn't even touch on UFOs, but we're out of time for today. I want to thank our guest, Eugene Braxton, for giving us a glimpse into his fascinating life. If you'd like to listen again to this or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about the work of IANS, check out their website, iands.org. And tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.